So, welcome to Out of the Box, the podcast. So, if you are a returning listener, thank you very much for joining us today. And if you are a new listener, then welcome to the podcast. This podcast is made for creatives, whether you're looking to turn your hobby or passion into a job, then this podcast is definitely for you. Today is very exciting because we have our very first guest on the podcast. Welcome, Mr. Rob Parker. Hello there, fellas. It's great, <laughs> absolutely great to see you, and the honour is all mine, seriously. Thank you for having me. Thank you Appreciate for coming it. on, man. I've been super excited about this. <laughs> so <laughs> so misguided. <laughs> so we met at, when we did our BBC um, Share Your Story a few months back. That's and, right. And since then, I've I've read your book, I've got another book, and I am loving it. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's weird to see Warrington in that kind of setting, isn't it? You know, like a, um, a story with uh, a fast moving story with cops and robbers and all that kind of stuff. Because we don't get any of that stuff kind of here, do we? You know, no, definitely not. I mean, I'll come back to it later about this book in particular, but that has been such a standout for me is the whole Warrington thing about it. I've I've loved. So before we get into like mm. the 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 nitty gritty of of your work, do you want to sort of introduce yourself and yeah, sort sure. of give us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm Rob Parker. I'm um, an author. It always feels really weird saying author. I didn't feel like, still not sure I've quite earned that title, but you never, I don't think you ever feel like you quite do. Um, uh, I've been published uh, 10 books under my own name. There's a um, X number of other books that are out there that I've written um, for, well, ghost written for uh, famous people, I guess. Um, people um, with uh, stories to tell, but not the means to tell them themselves. So, uh, cool. It's been, I can't believe I get to do it. Um, it's, uh, I started doing this, um, taking it really seriously in 2012. Um, I can't believe that I'm still here 11 years later, give or take, just still doing it. It's a mad industry. It's a mad old world, um, the book world. Um, but I, you know, if it blows up tomorrow, I'll be smiling and you'll see uh, me doing something else, but still with a big smile on my face that I gave it a good go, you know? Yeah, brilliant. So, Let's go back then. Let's go back to where it all began. So, you know, I feel like an author isn't a job that one day you can just apply for. I can imagine it's a sort of a, a long process. So tell us about the sort of, you said 11 years. Is that since you became like full time or is that just your whole sort of when you said, this is what I'm going to do or? Yeah, no. So six years of full time, it took me um, five years to get any kind of pay from this um and the first um payment was a check for i think it was like 12 pound 87 something actually it's 12 dollars 87 oh, nice. from my agent at the time <laughs> um which uh you know and i still i didn't cash it actually i've still got it <laughs> uh, it's like more symbolic like you actually made money from writing something uh, but no like i think it's like with yourselves and music isn't it you know like you you're doing it a long time before you decide to try and make a career out of it or to try and take it to another level so um, as soon as I was able to read and write, I was writing stories. Um, and I was gutted that first day of school that I didn't learn to read on the very first day because I, I wanted to be around books. I wanted to have books. Books were like, they're still like, I'm drawn to them. Um, and it's not the coolest thing I'll ever admit to, but I flipping love it when, I'm, when there's books somewhere and I can't tear myself away from the shelves because like there's so much culture and society and knowledge in those like it's a small thing in it i'm not saying there's culture and society and knowledge in that thing but <laughs> there is you know what i mean like when you see a load of books somewhere it's like costs nothing to be able to read and i've always felt that like it and it reading and stories should be accessible to absolutely everyone um but stories just the, like the very nature of stories always had a really big hold of me like they're um culturally they're a way that we um looked after each other that like shared knowledge and entertained each other and stuff like that and I honestly, I think creativity in that area is so powerful. You know, it's just, and it costs nothing to do. It's not like you need to go and, you know, I've never been educated yeah. in writing writing stories. Aside from, you know, like um, English language at A level, that kind of stuff. But from there, I've never had a lesson or anything else about writing. It's just been, I want to write stuff that I like, you know, and it was always the same. So I was always writing. I thought screenplays was going to be the way I'd get started. So I wrote, um, when I was 16, I wrote the... Um, <laughs> Uh, Jurassic Park 3 before it happened oh cool I was going through a major Van Damme phase so um, yeah it was um, like the island they didn't know what to do with the island and the, the prisons were full so why don't we just drop the hardest prisoners onto the island and Van Damme was one of those prisoners 
he <laughs> ended up roundhouse kicking a raptor. <laughs> that sounds better than it does sound better. <laughs> <Like that. laughs> Hollywood hit me up, seriously. Um, but that was like I learned so much doing it, and it was it's the hottest garbage ever. But I love it, and, and the, I firmly believe there's never a word wasted as well. You know, like um, and, and much the same way with music, there's never a note wasted. I think every time that you you exercise that muscle, that creative muscle, you're getting better and better, and you're working to the end. You know to to well i don't know where it's all going for any of us but you know what i mean like you're getting better you're refining your process i hate that word craft when it comes to this stuff but i suppose you know the stuff has to come out of you some way so yeah i can yeah. definitely relate to that as like the songwriter yeah in the av club like obviously you've got to write a lot of like for lack of better words you've got to write a lot of shit before sometimes something good absolutely comes right out. yeah like and you know like heartache you know like when you know going through those difficult teenage years you know like i wrote loads of stuff thinking this is going to be like my big you know big breakthrough moment or whatever mm -hmm. like and it was just like i look back at it like whoa that was bad <laughs> you know, really really bad um but you grow you know yeah. you grow by living and doing and and working at it you know you just keep working um so I, like two thousand words i've written today you just got to keep working that muscle keep going Horrid expression, sorry, that's an awful expression. <laughs> Some of my essays in university were like 3,000 words and it took me about three months. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but again, it's like anything. The more you do it, the easier it comes to you, you know. Yeah. So you don't like, I know it feels like a weird undertaking. Like, it's a mad undertaking. Like, I'm going to lock myself away for a number of months and I'm going to write a book. What well, weirdo does that, honestly? But once you've done it once, you know you can do it again. And yeah. again and again and again. And yeah, it becomes sort of second nature in a way. So now I can do two books at the same time, you know. That's and, insane. Yeah, but not like not the same kind of thing though. Yeah, the themes have got to be a bit different. So, like for example, <laughs> I'm doing a ghostwriting project for um, a guy who has got um, Parkinson's, and it's about how he's sort of like gone from the absolute depths of how shattering it is to be given such a diagnosis and to think that your future can be very bleak to being the happiest he's probably ever been. You know, um, over a course of twenty years and you know, tens of thousands of tablets um, and experimental drugs and stuff. I couldn't write two of those at the same time, but I'm doing yeah. that one in the mornings and in the afternoons I'm writing my next crime book. So it's because they're different. I can work it. Mm. Yeah. It's amazing. So in, in this podcast, obviously, go, just going back to the thing you said about the, that first check you got through, <laughs> yeah. in this podcast, we've spoke a lot about sort of that moment where your passion or your hobby, whatever it might be, that it clicks in your mind and you think could this be my career if I take the right steps now at what part as an author did you turn around and say I can't give half to this anymore I have to give everything to become an author does that, does that make sense yeah absolutely um that was very early on in not in my like writing because we're all writers aren't we you know like every time you pick up a pen you're a writer but I think that moment when um it was Christmas 2012 I'd written the first book in the Ben Bracken series of which there are five and um, I didn't know who to give it to or anything. I didn't know. I'd just done it because um, I'd actually injured my knees playing football and I needed 18 months out of work. Um, so at the time, I was uh, a mix of a van driver and a, a county court advocate. Um, just muddling along, trying to find what I wanted to be, where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do, that kind of stuff. Um, and... Um, 18 months out of work was suddenly like, what on earth am I going to do now? I've got no clue. Um, and I was like, there was a no shame in saying ever when you're struggling, I was struggling. Like um, the mental spiral had hit me and I was going down and down and down. Um, and this was when Jeremy Kyle was still on telly and I was just sat there like in the mornings like, is this what life is now? I just can't, this can't be it. Um, and during that, I got so wrapped up in what was going on with me that um, I totally forgot to keep reading. Like I just stopped. So um, dug out Jaws again. Jaws is my favourite book, the Benchley original. Um, dug it out again. I got it from um, Craft Carnival when I was 12. Um, I'd been given a quid to go and buy sweets. Um, and while I was buying the sweets, I saw there was a box of books to the, you know, like secondhand charity books. And um, the top two were Jaws and Clear and Present Danger by Tom Clancy. And I'm thinking they were 25p each. And I'm thinking like, if I can just, you know, 50p, 50p, <laughs> you know. Um, never read the Tom Clancy one. Red Jaws that night, and it like blew my hair back, like blew my socks off. I just couldn't believe that books could be like this, um, and that was like a very formative moment. So yeah, reading Jaws again in 2012, it was like 
this is this this is what I've always wanted to do I've always wanted to be involved with why don't I go back to that now I'm never going to get another chance to have all this time to sit and write a book so I wrote a book in 12 weeks um at the time it was called the baby and the brandy um and then uh eventually it became known as a wanted man when publishers got involved um and I went on the Kindle store and just uploaded it and like within a minute <laughs> I'd literally pressed the end and then uploaded the word document like almost by mistake like is it really this easy oh yeah it is there it is <laughs> and it was like it was on there and people bought it and i think <clears throat> the moment was that i realized to go back sorry i've gone all around the house no, no, to answer no. the question but the moment that i realized i'm all in now was when it got its like one of its very early reviews and it was like there's a lot of errors but there's something here we quite like and i was yeah. like this wasn't a fool's errand me writing this wasn't just to get it out of my system if i can hone this and work on this i can get better at this, at this and hopefully make a career out of it yeah and that feeling sort of became a reason to chase that feeling again of yeah. you know the good reviews the sort of you you've you put everything into something and people have enjoyed it and stuff did that obviously that made you turn around and say right i'm going to just give everything to yeah. this to this industry now absolutely i spent the next six weeks after that writing the sequel um and then after you know three months it was like 12 weeks ish i had two books and i had no idea what to do with them um and that's when i started trying to find an agent because if you want to try and make a career i'd be really you know you have to be very lucky on um and very very dedicated sorry i should say that there are some amazing authors out there who are doing fabulous things with self-publishing and they're doing things that you know big publishing houses can only dream of but some of that, I'm sure they would say, is a mixture of luck to go with the incredible hard work they've put in. Um, and uh, for me, I decided that I wanted to, I wanted to uh, see my book in shops, you know, so that my mum could buy it, or you know, that kind of thing. And um, so I went looking for agents, and I approached 250 in the first wave of agents, um, all with this like this letter, like you know, I've written this book, really hope you like it, give it a read. Um, I'm a dedicated young fella and I'll you know keep trying hard. Uh and um I got um 250 rejections <laughs> like mm. out of hand like um two, 200 didn't even get back in touch with me. 200 didn't get back in touch with me. Um 50, 40 got back to say thanks but no thanks and 10 got back and were like you're wasting your time and our time and you should stop now. One was like um you will never make it like this oh, American agent said, like you will never, you you you've got nothing. You've what was the, the expression? You have no unique voice. You've got nothing to say. So, I, it was like that moment when that happened was like unlocking a cheat code. Like, oh, I flipping love that. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. keep throwing that at me. That's great. So now I absolutely love getting bad reviews. Don't go out, people, and give me bad reviews, please. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love it because it just makes me want to beat you. You know, so I imagine people find themselves at a crossroad at that point. Yeah, two hundred fifty people is a lot of people. Yeah, and two hundred fifty, as you said, rejections is is probably a lot to take on the chin. And I imagine a lot of people in any career probably find themselves at a crossroad at that point of, do you listen or do you do you does it light the fire inside you? I guess and well, the latter. I guess, in this case, I guess yeah. we can see what the answer was. Well, it, I think at the same time though, I think every writer goes through it. This is not like a new thing, and every creative goes through this as well because creation is such a subjective thing that you can't possibly appeal to every taste all at the same time um and just getting a bit of it right you know it is worth the effort i think you know of making some people like when readers come and say they enjoyed your book that that really is a wonderful feeling the, the real jackpot feeling i think is when people say um i liked your book and it, it got me out of a reading slump or i wasn't a reader but now i am because i enjoyed your book that's like because oh, that's i think back to what reading means to me and the joy it's given me and like to give that to somebody else you know, it's almost like inspiring people yeah i hope yeah. i hope i hope so um but you know where we're from though we need more readers and writers you know our libraries are in trouble everywhere and we need we need more voices from here we really really do mm. i remember being a kid and like going down begging my mum to take me down to the library with the library card and yeah i always had a library books. Card. and it was like a it was yeah. like an event of the week where we used to go and i don't think like kids are more interested in like playing and playing playstation and things these days but i suppose when you get when you get to it like you say we need we need to go back to that whole sort of like making making an event out of going to the library picking a book yeah reading it taking it back oh, i was great and there was never any rush about it. you could sit there for a while and just you know digest oh shall i have this one shall i have this one i have to admit that the library was the first place i think i was aged 10-ish 
when I found a conspiracies book mm. and I was like, wow, this is cool. Um, and in, inside it were pictures of JFK's post-mortem. I was like, <laughs> scarred for years, <laughs> absolutely scarred for years. So libraries can do, you know, oh, but it's free knowledge, isn't it? It's yeah. free exposure to stuff that you would never usually come near. And it's just down the road, like they're everywhere, you know, go and use them. They're, they're absolutely incredible. And they need, they need our help as well. And also like reading and that free knowledge as well will give young people, old people, every person, the chance to be able to uh, form your own opinions and think for yourself. And we need, my God, we need that at the moment, don't we? You know, the, the, that autonomy of thought and control over your own thought. When we're told, you know, what to wear, what to, you know, mm -hmm. how to vote, you know, what to think about this and that and the other, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think reading will give everything. So what would you say, sort of like a young aspiring sort of like storyteller or script writer, anything along the lines of being a writer or an author, what would you say would be the first point of call, like what to, to get them into it? Like what, what would you say is like, I don't know, something that maybe they wouldn't know that could get you into it or like uh, leads into the industry or anything yeah. like that? Um, I think that's such a good question because when I first started wanting to do this, authors were just not accessible. You know, like I, I didn't know any, I'd never come across any. In school, you know, you have people come in and visit on school, like at schools now. When I was a kid, um, we had one person come in, I think, and it was a, um, a bird watcher at school. I was like, is that what I'm going to be? <laughs> you know, like, that's cool. You know, I love all that stuff, but like, I, I'm sure there's a bit more. <laughs> um, so I didn't know that being an author was something I was allowed to do. And certainly from here in the Northwest, you don't hear a lot of that stuff, you know, like about authors knocking about or writers knocking about or anything like that. And you certainly didn't see them. So I didn't know it was something I was allowed to do at all, mm. anything creative like that. Um, that wasn't to, to, to say that the people around me weren't supportive of what I was doing. My parents were incredibly supportive of, they, were, they knew how much I loved writing. Uh, but also my teachers were always great about that as well. But the, there wasn't a network for getting you, you know, able to go out and write. Um, for for young people who want to write, I will find I would say, um, just write. Get a pen and a, pa a piece of paper. You don't need anything more than that. Write the story you wanna you wanna read. Write for you first. Please yourself first. Write what you wanna read and dig the hell out of it. Just have an absolute blast because if you're enjoying something, the brilliance shines. I think you know it'll be the same with music. I'm absolutely sure. If you're digging it, you know you're hitting it. You know that like all the planets are aligning and things are working. Um, and I think the same thing applies here. Just do what you like to do. There's that old adage, isn't there? You know, like true happiness is if you can um, find what makes you weird and get people to pay money for it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I have fully embrace my weirdness. If I have to go weirder, I will. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that because me and Ollie have been speaking on previous episodes of this podcast and sort of like what could get you into sort of our industry, like the recording industry or the video industry, photography industry. And both of our both of our answers were to just go and do it. Like yeah. I don't think there's a better way of getting into something than going and actually just doing it. You'd be I, I totally agree with that. And you learn on the job as well, don't you? You know 100%. like Yeah. Um and again, you know, like no one you find your own ways of doing things as well. So um I'm very lucky that I'm um interview a lot of authors and I always say, you know, like, what? how do you do this? How do you do that kind of thing? Every answer is different. There's no set way of going about any of this stuff, I don't think. There's not like a checklist you can do which will go, ding, ding, here you are, here's a best-selling novel or whatever. It doesn't work like that. So certainly getting out there and learning on the job is important. But also, I think if you reach out to people, once you've got something, I think people are incredibly, can be incredibly kind and receptive to that sort of thing. You know, I would be nowhere if it weren't for the kindness of a number of people. Um, who took a chance on me, uh, but also um, gave me a, a shout out when, you know, when there was absolutely no skin in the game, you know. But for example, this book, Far From The Tree, um, that's owed to uh, an editor I wanted to work with at the publisher One World. Um, her name is Jenny Parrott, and I got in touch with her and said, I, I'd love to work with you. I love what you do with one of your other authors. You're a dream publisher for me and a dream editor. And uh, she just, she said, it's not for me, Rob, but I know who it might be before can I pass this on and she did and it changed my career you know mm. just like that and it was an act of selfless kindness that I'll always be grateful for so yeah people good there are good people out there so yeah put stick your head up stick your neck out and reach out and you'll be surprised you know if you're polite and smile and whatever yeah. you you go about your business with respect you'd be surprised what comes back yeah 
because I know I know you do obviously it's how we met at the school. Mm. I know you do a lot of work sort of in and out of the schools. What what makes you is it because when you were younger and you had those aspirations, you didn't know any authors? Do you think that leans into the fact why you feel like you have, you know, such a reason to go into these schools? Like, why, why do you think it's so important that you sort of give your time into into the next generation of authors, if you like? Yeah, I think you're always expected, I think, when you're in school to possibly sometimes do a certain thing and follow a certain path. Certainly with myself, it was like I could do English and history. So the, my school at the time was like, right, well, you need to go and do law then. You know, it was like, well, hang on, I don't have any interest in that whatsoever. But I bowed to it in the end. And I shouldn't have at all. I shouldn't have. Um, I'm very glad that I did the degree and stuff. But I was three years of going like, I don't want to be doing this, you know. But I did it because they asked me to do it. And they told me that was the direction that I should take. Um, and certainly I want to be able to go and show young people from similar um places and backgrounds as myself to say look you, you really can be anything you want to be you know and it's not really to preach that um it's not really to preach at all i should say but it's not really to to preach that that writing is what i want you all to do it's more that doing what you want to do is the most important thing like look i i decided what i wanted to do and i just got relentless about it and i didn't stop and then i'm the happiest <laughs> you know like i can't believe i get to do it whereas if you want to go and do summer, go and do it. Just go and do it. The only per the only no that will ever matter is the no you tell yourself. So if you want to go, you know, people will tell you you're not good. People will tell you you're worthless. People will tell you that your stories, your your background, you don't matter. Just ignore them. Just do it anyway. And then, you know, it, you will get, you will find so much strength and self-respect in doing that as well that you'll feel you can do anything after that. School School's very strange, isn't it? Because even though now more modern, there are those creative subjects there, you know, the, you know, media has grown to what it is. And even though those creative subjects exist, there's music, there's drama. Even when I was at school and doing media and doing music, even though the subjects were there, I still felt like the direction was that they're not quite real jobs. Yeah. They, they are jobs, but to get to them, you don't, don't do them straight away. Do, do something more academic or do something. Do that on the side. And then do yeah. it on the side. I think it, it is slowly changing, but still working in a school now the the subjects exist and they're great and the, the departments are amazing but i still feel like sometimes the direction is to be more academic totally and agree. it's hard to sort of and maybe you've got your parents who say yeah you know in, enjoy your music but you know just for now let's do this at, you know at some point you've got to, you can't do two things and if, if you want to carry on something you've, you've got to you've got to carry it on and that was the difficulty i faced in school yeah that sort of understanding that you're just because it's your passion your hobby doesn't mean it can't be your career yeah, those two things don't have to be separate. Yeah. yeah, they can be the same thing, you know. It used to be said that, like, oh, no, you've got to, you know, you're very lucky you do what you love for a job. Like, no, 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 you put, put your hand up and say, this is what I want to do. This is what, you know, and I feel I can be really good at it. You know, I remember when, so I did my law degree and then um, I went and did a film production degree after that. Um, and I loved it. I was finally doing what I really wanted to do. But I remember I came home for Christmas or summer holidays or one or the other. And a family friend said to me, so how does it go? How does it feel to go from doing law, which is a hugely well-paid job, or can be a hugely well-paid job, to going and doing a job that you will never um, have a well-paid job in? You know, like, and it's like, is that the attitude that we're all up against? And it is, you know, it, it, we do face that kind of thing, you know, certainly in the creative industry. What would help is if the creative industry itself learned to pay creatives properly, mm -hmm. you know, and value their expertise, you know, because if we, if we down tools... They'd be floundering. <laughs> yeah, we've seen it this week in, in the music industry with the likes of like BBC Industries and coming under threat and things like that. You know, in lockdown, what did people turn to? TV, music, yeah. podcast, books. They're the creative arts. No one wants to sit at home and learn law. No. You turn to the arts, but then they get underfunded. So I think you're right. If, if there was more sort of trust in the arts, maybe totally people would treat them differently, but... I suppose that's just that's just the way it can be sometimes. Yeah, but it shouldn't. It, I mean, you know, we 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 love what we do, and we work so so hard. I mean, like if people like I know I I say to people I treat the job like a nine to five, but it's not like that at all. It's like it's more like a sixteen hour day, like mm. every day, because I, I can't switch off when the kids are in bed, uh, and I've got three mega children who my whole life is about wanting them to have just ah oh, just love them, um, <laughs> but they. Everything is about 
my, them and my wife and I want them to be just have everything I could ever give them and then I've got right you know when they're in bed and they're settled or whatever I'm like right it's time to hit it again let's keep going keep going and um I've burnt out a couple of times be dead honest um recently most recently before Christmas I went to um a Newcastle Noir one of the uh Newcastle uh, the, the book festivals and it was amazing but it was just a mad weekend of like full-on great you know chatting with readers and writers everything and i got home and like my body was like that's mm. it that's it you are done for a bit now um but i wouldn't change anything wouldn't yeah. change anything yeah brilliant yeah. um so rob briefly before you mentioned obviously your first series of books which is fire was the ben bracken series yeah um and then you also mentioned that you know one of the things you hope to do is to get people that have not picked up a book in a long time to pick up a book and start reading again we spoke about like the library card. That's exactly what I was doing. I used to love reading. I used to love it. And for whatever, I, I stopped and I've not read for quite a long time. And then when I met you at the BBC, I, I said to you, didn't I, you know, what, what, what would you say to someone that just wants to sort of ease the way back in and start reading or whatever? And you said, oh, just, just sort of start. So obviously I, st I started with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> and I've, I started reading this far from the tree. And honestly, I'm, I, I have thoroughly enjoyed picking it up and start i have to admit it took me a while to sort of read open the cover yeah because i've not read in so long it's a discipline isn't it it's it's another um it's it, it, it's another sort of uh what's the word it's a muscle that doesn't the reading muscle again why are we talking about muscle so much <laughs> but like, it's another muscle that you need to keep using isn't it it, it was getting, harder to it was getting yeah. past the first cover yeah it was like you know, going to the gym for the first time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not that I go to the gym either, but... <laughs> I did that. I got to the gym the first time. Never been back since. <laughs> Didn't work for me. <laughs> but but I've really enjoyed it. One of the... This leads me on to my next point, because one of the things I've really enjoyed about it is things that are familiar, I think, help you get into something. And this book is about Warrington. Yeah. And it's been so strange reading a book. It's like the bargain booze and... Is it, yeah. is, is it McDonald's on Winnick Road? Yeah, yeah. You know, he's at Warrington Police Station at Old Victoria Bat. And like that kept me engaged even more so because of the familiarity of it. And I just sort of wanted to know you're from Warrington, but why did you feel like your stories had to, not had to, but you wanted to keep Warrington at the forefront of your story? Yeah, it's um, very, very simply. It's because I think we've got um, such a, a rich potential for stories to come from here. Um, that hasn't really been properly explored or told in the past. When I tried to get this book sold, um, the universal question was, where is Warrington? You know, and then you'd say, well, it's 30 miles between, it's in that 30 mile difference between Liverpool and Manchester. And they'd be like, oh, I kind of get that, you know, but trying to explain this to someone who's not from the Northwest or the North or anything like that um, was very hard going. Um, and a lot of people were like, well, why? should it matter? Why does Warrington matter or anything like that? And I'm like, right, I'll tell you mm. why, you know. Mm. Um, I think we've got an amazing identity here. We, we're half man, half scout, aren't we? You know, like we've got the best and worst of both of those different sets of characteristics. And out of that, we forged our own identity. Um, we're on the direct trade, trade route between the two, which I think has got like, there's so much deep rooted, deep rooted story potential in there. Um, but also, it's the fact that you can dive between two major um, northern powerhouse cities in half an hour or 40 minutes or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. down the East Lanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, It's just unbelievable. Um, so with that in mind, um, and, and I say this about, about you know, certainly where we live in general, is that you get in the car and drive 10 minutes, everyone sounds different. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, and their way of living is different. It's so amazing where we live for that variety. And that's not to say... Everywhere else in the country isn't like that. But my own hometown, I felt like, had an awful lot to offer in a storytelling sense. And I wanted to find the vehicle to champion it. I also think it's fascinating that we, at the time I was writing it, we didn't really have that, like, dedicated police force. You know, we, we, were, we were an offshoot of Merseyside Police, Cheshire Constabulary, Lancashire, yeah. and Greater Manchester Police. Like... There must be a jurisdictional nightmare. Yeah. So I used to I used to research all the the police stuff, and then I actually spoke with um a copper, and I said it was a writer as well. I said like, how do I navigate all the police stuff in these books? You know, he said, just don't worry about it because if you get five or so things right that sound authentic, you've got your audience. That's fine. And do them early. You've got you know put them things in there early. You've got your audience. It's fine. Which is why like early in the book, there's a moment where one of the characters says, you know, like I want you to go and check Vicap and Holmes. 
and like they just sound like great acronyms. They're there for the databases, you know, for all the. Yeah. But like immediately, it's like, hey, that sounds like really. Well, so I was going to ask. You know? <laughs> I was going to ask. I was going to say at a point like that because I was reading, thinking, literally thinking. Just has Rob done like I had to do like a year of in depth, <laughs> no. you know, police research and stuff. No. You know, where where do you find this information? No, because that daunted me. It really daunted me that I wanted to write a cops and robbers thing, but I was thinking like, I know nothing about this at all. How am I going to go about it? And um, it was reaching out to this copper, and he said like, if you were going to write these totally true to real police work, it would just be four hundred pages of paperwork. Mm. You know, like literally, it would be the most boring thing. So just hook your audience do a bit of stuff that sounds about right. And when this came out, I went to him and I said, like, look, mate, I'm sorry. I think I took your thing about, you know, not sweating mm -hmm. a bit too far because procedure gets abused quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun. We're having fun. Yeah. We're making stuff up. It's a story. It's about bad guys and good guys doing terrible things to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, I, I mean, I haven't finished it, as you can see, I'm a little... Pikachu, no, uh, Pikachu book. I'm wondering whereabouts you are in here at the moment, but um... I, I am, I am, I am really enjoying it, and, and the Warrington side has been a big factor of, of sort of the enjoyment. And it, it's funny because you know the places. If, if I was from London, never heard of Warrington. The places could be fictional, but because I'm from Warrington, it just adds you know that extra. Are, yeah, yeah. I, I can, I can visualise the story more. Yeah, because I can feel where he stood. Well, the, the... yeah, I, I think that that was dead important to me because I feel like if setting with this one i certainly wanted the story to go in all sorts of different directions and i like it when you're, you're watching something you're reading something and you get the feeling that no one is safe like anyone anything terrible could happen at any time and when the stakes are that high i'm totally drawn in but it obviously takes a little bit of faith on behalf of the reader to go along with that so i thought if i just get the setting spot on and make sure the setting is totally believable and what more you know how do I make it more believable than literally referencing real places? <laughs> you know, yeah. Like if I get that right, then I can pull pull away and do more flights of fancy elsewhere. If you know what I mean, um, and hope the reader comes along with me. Yeah, there was there was one bit uh, last night that I was reading, and he sat in the car park at Winnet Road McDonald's having his breakfast, and I was like, I've sat. I know exactly where he might be sat, and I could like yeah. sort of <laughs> yeah. picture myself and stuff. And and I hit a bit of a twist last last night. Um, as I was reading, I said to <laughs> said to Laura, my girlfriend, I'll, I'll, I'll stop now and go to bed. I was like midnight, and then it was like quarter past one. I was like, just one, like, we'll just do one more. <laughs> nice. And that's... And that's sort of what I've missed. Like I remember feeling that when I was younger, like yeah. when I read all the Harry Potters and stuff, they were like the the most books I've ever read Harry Potters, and I felt like that. And I, it sort of reminded me of like why I used so, to enjoy reading. So made my day with that, man, because reading should i don't believe you know like if you reading can be for everyone but there's different things for different times just like movies you know like a different movie for different occasions and whatever but books i don't think necessarily should be hard it shouldn't be hard to get in pick them up and read you know um and there are other areas of fiction that can provide that i just want to tell a good story you know seriously like and small chapters as well the goal and i'm so sorry ollie the goal was like if i can rob people of sleep that's i'm doing my mm. job right you know <laughs> Um, so the goal, yeah, if you, if you ever see me win an award for any of this stuff, it would be totally by accident. It was never the intention. I just want to entertain. Yeah. So staying on to that subject, like, I've been one of them people that have always struggled reading. I think I've got a slight hint of, like, ADHD where I'll, I'll read a page in about an hour and then I'll get to the end of it and I'll think, oh, shit, what happened at the top? <laughs> and I'll have to go back up. But also... um Relating back again to the uh, the achievements there, you um, can see on this fact sheet that we've got here that you've got number one Audible bestseller list yeah. for this particular book. Yeah. Um, how does it sort of like feel to sort of like achieve that for one and for two to have your sort of like written words be translated into sort of like an audio book? Because I feel like some, for me, because I'm not the best reader, like not I can't read because I can, but because I can't engage with the words as much. I feel like that would be sort of more of the avenue that I would go down. Well, it's it's amazing <clears throat> you, you say that, Joe, because the, this book itself, you know when I was telling you the story about Jenny Parrott who passed it on? She actually passed it on to Audible. Um, mm -hmm. And they, she said they're looking for strong stories, dialogue, uh, rich in di good dialogue. She she said good. I was like, you think it's good? Oh, mate. <laughs> you know, like, but rich in dialogue, um, and they might go for this, and they did. Um so when they took it, and this was after I'd shopped it around all over the place. I was I was between agents at the time as well. Um, shopped it around all over the place. And the thing I'd get back was, we, you know, the standard of writing is fine. It's just the location. Sadly, being, you know, 
books with a northern flavour appears to be a bit of a diversity issue. And if you can believe that, like me being northern is like a diversity box to tick. Like I am a super privileged white guy. Mm. How I'm a diversity issue, I've got no idea. <laughs> there are so many other people to champion, you know. Um, but that's the case. There is a north-south divide. There really is. So when it came to this, one of the big publishers said, we absolutely love it, Ron. We'd love to do it. But um, we, we, uh, we've done one book set in the North this year. And I looked at the list and there's a, they do 100 crime books a year, one from the North. And it's just like... So with that, I want, I want to show that we have something to say here. You know, mm. there, there is value and merit in our creative output here. Um, and we've got stories to tell, you know. Um, so, yeah, when, it, when, it, when, when Audible took a chance on it, we were very lucky with, they said, who do you want, you know, to, you know, if you've got an ideal casting, because they said, we want to make a good push for this. So who do you want to have, have in there? And uh, honestly, the the answer was always Warren Brown, because he um, is a, an actor from Warrington. So he gets the whole Warrington thing. You know, it's not like it needs explaining to him or anything. And his voice is spot on. But he's also the guy who I had in mind to be, you know, if it ever was made into a telly thing, to be the cop. You know, um, and um, he trains at the same gym I train at. Um, so he's a, a ex Muay Thai world champion and um, hard man. <laughs> and he was training on the other side of the gym. So I box, he's on the other side doing his Muay Thai. And between rounds, I went over to him and I was like, come on, Rob. You know, and in the rounds intervening, I was like, is this? No. Because mm -hmm. no. no. <laughs> we're all on the same bell in the gym, you see. So um, the round went, and I was like, to my trainer, right, I'll be right back. And I went over to him. I said, mate, I'm so sorry. You must get all the time. All the time. Um, but I'm writing something at the minute, and I'd really like you to be the guy who's involved with it because um, it's kind of a part that I've always had you in mind for. And I'm not going to bother you anymore, but I just want you to put a name to a face when hopefully one day that message or email comes through to you. And he was like, yeah, no, no worries, mate. Hit me up on Instagram, he said. So <laughs> I was like, okay, you know, uh, and I left him to it and left it at that. And um, yeah, it was three years later, my phone rang, it was an un unknown number and it was him. And he's like, you're that fellow from the gym, aren't you? I was like, yeah. He said, I've been sending you a book, I'm going to do it. I was like, I can't believe it. Was, yeah, it was, was I just, three years as well. Yeah, it was three years later, yeah. Wow. Um, I couldn't incredible. remotely believe it. How does um, it feel to sit on that? Had you written the book at that point? Uh, no, I was, I'd started it. Oh, you was, it was already in your mind. Yeah, I'd started right. writing it. So I was about a quarter of the way through when I saw him. I just, because I was trying to write, with this book, I was trying to write my first sort of like, grown-up book you know a grown-up breakout book like the Ben Bracken books I had so much fun with um but they're you know arguably more fantastical you know they're kind of they often get compared to the Jack Reachery stuff you know like one man on a mission kind of stuff um and I had so much fun with it and I'd love to write them again but um I wanted to do something different more the kind of thing that you'd see more on television that kind of thing you know like a a real unpredictable cops and robbers thing um, so that's where this idea came from. So yeah, it was very early in development. I saw him and thought, what's the expression they say in the Northeast? Shy Burns getting out. <laughs> <laughs> like, you just got to go for it. You got to take, your opportunities come along. You got to, you know, you got to take them. If something comes up, you got to take it. And if life throws you lemons, just go right ahead and make the zestiest lemonade you can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that sort of leads me on to your next point because you had such success with this book and congratulations are in order because you've just you. released the second in the series. Yeah, thank you. How does that feel to have something do so well and then be like, right, let's go again? <laughs> well, it's mad because I um, wrote that book two years ago, the right. sequel two years ago. So I can't really remember it. You know, so like in the last right. couple of weeks doing the, the promotional stuff, like people are like, you know, oh, this, you know, how did you go? I'm like, I can't remember. <laughs> I've, got, I've written four other books since then. I've got no So idea. was the sequel written sort of before the success of yes. this yeah right so that that sort of like pressure of... yeah there was no pressure right but that's good then isn't it no and it, what to, to to jump on the back of that um i've recently finished the third the, right so i always said to them it's only a trilogy that's all it's you know i don't want because sometimes you see great series and great book series as well go too far and you can tell that the spark's gone and there's an element of going through the motions um, and I'll never be drawn on saying which series I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about that, but we all have probably got an example where, yeah, this could have could have finished a long while ago, yeah. couldn't it? And there would have been a perfect moment. 
I always wanted to say, this is a trilogy and that is it. That is your lot. Um, so even in the very first contract for the for the trilogy, I knew it was Far From The Tree and Your Enemies Closer and The Only Truly Dead. That was it. And it's the only time I've ever had a book contract where the titles are actually written into the contract as well. So I know that The Only Truly Dead is finished. We're on our last round of edits on it. And that one killed me because I would get messages from people saying, you better not let something happen to this person <laughs> nah. or you better not let the cat die or whatever, you know, like anything like that. Like, And I'm like, it just, it swallowed me. Well, that's Absolutely when you know you've made it, Rob, when you've got I people can't, 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 pining it, for your character <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> I suppose it shows people are truly invested in I these hope, stories. Oh God, I hope so. I hope so. Because in the second book, I know there's a, there's a cliffhanger element. Ooh, no spoilers. Yeah, no spoilers. <laughs> but, but we take that, that idea that no one is safe to another sort of level, I guess. Um, but I love that. I love not knowing. Mm. Isn't it great when you have those like OMG moments in telly and films and books? Like, I love those moments. I prefer watching TV shows when I feel like the writers or... or I guess books now can can be brave, where you know that the not they're not safe. And yeah, it's sort of nothing's out of bounds and stuff. That's why like, my one of my favorite shows of all time, and I've never actually read the books to me as a commitment. But Game of Thrones for me was always yeah. that because you loved the characters so much, but it didn't matter because they just weren't safe. Absolutely, and I think that's braver and stuff. I do prefer that. I agree. I would say that you know while it's totally different, Game of Thrones. That, that kind of storytelling um, really resonated with me and I probably didn't even know it, but you know, telling a story over a longer arc as well, you know, like, so knowing I was doing a trilogy, it gave me three books to play with. So it's like, ah, I know I can set something up in book one and have it pay off in book three, that kind of thing. Um, so I knew, I knew always where it was going to end um, and I'm really glad it's finished. <laughs> <laughs> really glad. So that will be out in, um, I know Warren's about to go in the studio on it in the next couple of months, so it'll be out late spring i think in audio um which goes back to our earlier thing joe about like the audio so with warren doing it he is a one-man show and he brings he brings so much weight to this material so he's doing like vo different voices for every character in it and it, it's just it's like listening to a movie it's yeah. just he's that good and he uh, uh, so much of the success is this is down to him warren man Wherever the uh, Warren buddy, thank you, because um, and he's a top top man. We we've been for a beer since, and um, just yeah, he's a star. I owe him so much. <laughs> That's like amazing, man. Yeah, you've got this trilogy, mm. which you seem to be way ahead of the curve. I thought you, I <laughs> thought you might have been like right, one book's done, quick on to the next one, but no, two, no. way ahead of the curve. Out. So twenty twenty three, you've released the book, you know, early into the year. Yeah. Such a strong start to the year. Do you have any like? I mean, I guess career aspirations. You know, to to have to have the accolades that you already have, is like you know a huge achievement in itself. Is there any like big aspirations that you hope to achieve this year? Any goals you're looking at hitting in terms of maybe even your personal career? I know you said about your boxing and stuff. You know what yeah. what's what's in store this year? Yeah. Yeah. That, link, yeah. that link kind of links with the question I had in the back of my mind as well as to if there was, and if, if if there was any at all aspiration to sort of actually convert these books and audio books onto like a screen but i don't want to budge in on no, this question no i, <laughs> no, I can answer all of these like i have i am i'm not even started yet with what i want to achieve here um and that's not me um you have to back your own horse oh 100 you know? so because no one else is at times no one else is going to back it so you've got to believe in yourself so i I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing it as hard as I possibly can. And if it blows up, absolutely fine. Um, I've actually, you know, times are tough, right? You know, like <laughs> we were talking about that, you know. So I'm also qualified in case that day comes as an Amazon driver. Like I just, <laughs> I got it sorted like um, it was last year. Just in case, if this doesn't go right, I've got, you know, it's fine. You can uh, and, just deliver your own books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you will see me smiling like mad because I gave this the absolute best that I could. I, I always... So um, the books are split into the threes. There's three parts in each book. That's because I always had in mind um, a three-part television, like weekend thing, Friday, Saturday, yeah. Sunday kind of thing. Um, but that said, um, anything like that, I I would love to be involved in that sort of stuff. Absolutely love to. There are conversations happening at the moment that I'm definitely not able to talk about. Um, but balls are moving. 
Yeah, right. wheels are turning. That's wheels a nice turning. idea. Yeah. Balls are moving. <laughs> sounds, a bit, that sounds a bit questionable. <laughs> We've just got away from muscles. A little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wheels, wheels are turning. They turn in very slow. Balls are moving really slow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they might be picking up the pace. Oh, they, well, who knows? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but no, I have a, a brilliant film agent and uh, film and TV agent, and um, yeah, she's fabulous and. Uh, who works alongside my absolutely amazing book agent, Madalena. And um, uh, I, I think like working with those two, uh, that's Georgie and Madalena, um, working with those two, I just feel like I'm um, working with the absolutely right people. Um, like I, I, I hope they get me <laughs> enough, but like I certainly look at them and go like, wow, they are kicking so much backside. Like I can't believe I'm along for this ride because they're going immense places, what they've achieved already. So yes, film and television is definitely something I want to be involved with. Um, I've got so many ideas um, for extra Jurassic Park movies that they would like, and we can do. Um, but no, there's there's literally I, I've written every book, every single book I've done has um, always had in the back of my mind how could I convert this to a script? Um, so to convert them to script, they're already set up that way, so it could be done. Would you ever aim to any release or publish any sort of like sort of fan fiction? Yeah, yeah, I'd absolutely. Love, yeah, straight away. Like <laughs> it's a question I ended. Then Rob, you're so excited. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm so excited about it. Yeah. Um. So, uh, I, oh, I'm a massive, uh, you know, big James Bond fan. Yeah. Right. So, um, I really, my favorite one is the Timothy Dalton 1989 movie, um, License to Kill, where he goes rogue, like, and chases a South American drug lord. Yeah. And he gets sacked by MI6 while he's doing it. I always thought Tim Dalton was just like the raddest Bond. <laughs> um, but I always thought that the Bond girl in that one, pa uh, Pam Bouvier, played by uh, Carrie Lowell, was like the one time I thought James Bond could settle down. You know, like mm. like legit settle down. So I, um, I've i been writing, <laughs> like, them at 60 in the Florida <laughs> Keys with a, sorry, the Caribbean, uh, on a Caribbean island with, um, like, a boat rental company. <laughs> but the past comes now. And, uh, oh, yeah. It's just, uh, I've just had the, like, when I've got a spare five minutes, like, what a James Bond that, like, in his 60s would do, like, still wearing lovely, you know, like, cream slacks and lovely, <laughs> lovely jumper servicing boats, and then being absolutely rad. So I just, I'm having the best time. Yeah, basically, like, the, if, if the Fleming estate would ever, like, you know, you can have this. You, know, you can absolutely have this. Um, well, that answers the question of what does, a, what does an author do in his spare time? <laughs> right, he, he writes. <laughs> yeah, right, not stop. <laughs> No, talking about aspirations, though, seriously, I'd love to write for children. I'd really love to write for children. Um, that, that, that doesn't surprise me that you said that because I, I feel, and especially watching you when we did the BBC 100 thing, like that just seems so clear. You have a real passion of talking to the, the, the children and stuff, and I can really see that you do want to inspire and stuff, and you want to like share your skill and stuff. So I can see that really clearly. Like I think that 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 does that's not surprising me you saying that. Yeah, I think I don't. Know. Because I've been to so many schools now. Um, at one point pre-pandemic, I was in front of a thousand school kids a month, and they couldn't not read any of my stuff. Like I was just an author that had some books with people. You know, every book seems like it's got someone walking away on the cover. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like we talked about it, one of the things. Like you know, what do you write about? Well, apparently it looks like I write about people wandering off. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so none of the kids have been able to to read anything I've written, and I won't want them to. Like my own kids as well. No. Because um, I did write a horror accidentally a few years ago as well. Um, it just—it was a normal mystery, and then it just got really minging. <laughs> couldn't stop it from going minging. Nice. Um, so I asked the publisher, like, "What do you think about the start of this?" And they said, "Would you like it to go extra minging?" And I went, "Well, yeah, we can lean into this." And we did. I had a load of fun with that, and I think that would be a good move as well. That's Blackstoke, but um, and that oh, we're sat really close to where that is set actually. Um, so. I always wondered what happened to the hospital, you know, on Winnick Park. Oh, yeah. Well, I was re watching this documentary about, because um, it's nice to watch documentaries and like part of your research, isn't it? You know, and there's so much of it out there now. So I was watching this one about uh, an, um, an asylum, as they used to call them, in um, New Jersey, which they flattened, but they forgot about the tunnel network underneath. All sorts of ne'er-do-wells were down there. So I thought about here, like, what would happen if they forgot about the tunnels under the hospital? What might be down there? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I had a really good time with that. Um, Come me out now. Very <laughs> disgusting as well. Yeah, because we're all like going to drive home past it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway, children's books. Yeah, children's books. Yeah, yeah, children's books. <laughs> um, no, that is an absolute like ultra goal. Like I have to have to achieve that. And I think looking at my schedule for the year, I think I'm going to be able to have a go at one in the summer. Um, right. Okay. 
So uh, the next thing is um, I've got things I want to achieve. Like I want to achieve some um, domestic um, stuff like uh, a commercial hardback. That's what I really like. I've got my ultimate career goals and they're between a couple of books at home, like written on a piece of paper, like, well, my 2030 goals, what I want to have done by 2030. But I feel like if I can just keep those to myself, I'm, you know, like, because they're, I think that's best big. with the goals. I don't, I don't, I think with, we've spoke about sort of our, you know, business goals, whatever. And sometimes it's nice to just keep mm. them under wraps because not because yeah. you're not, you're scared you're going to hit them or you don't want people to know or whatever. It's just nice to work on them in the background. Yeah. I think I got the idea for writing it down from um, um, the author, Stephen, Stephen Keady. He wrote this brilliant book called Running and Jumping. And I got sent it last year. And obviously like with me being in the crime world, I guess, you get sent a lot of books um, with a crime tinge to them. And I got to send this book about um, a rivalry between two long jumpers, between two, you know, between three Olympic cycles. And I was like, I just, I, we'll just give it a go. And it was just devastatingly brilliant. And like, I was absolutely hooked, like like you were the other night, like reading like well past bed, bedtime, um, and just hooked. It was the most dramatic thing I'd read. Like, and the, the protagonist of that book um, had uh, between his dictionaries, um, uh, a little piece of paper, a gold medal in Beijing, or um, I think it was either Beijing or Athens, I think. And and I just thought, like, isn't that cool? You know, like, you know it's there. Yeah. You set your goal out. You've set your own marker, your own standard for yourself to try and get to. Um, so that's the first time I've ever done that, actually. It's yeah. inspired me, yeah. That's um, class. Yeah. But uh, no, uh, short term, I want to um, write as many books as I can. Um, it's one of those jobs where you don't necessarily have to retire. So I really want a great big body of work to pass on to my children, you know, when I'm, yeah. when I'm gone. Um, if it makes them any money, that's great. If it's just daddy's, like, maniac pamphlets, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's also fine. Like, yeah. if they've got 30 weird books up there and they're like, he was a weirdo, wasn't he, dad? <laughs> you know, like, that's also fine. Um, but, yeah, that's that's yeah. the goal, yeah. Um, so my question about this book and just looping back around to the thing, you know, the whole horror genre and you know, the, the nitty gritty of some of the things you write about. How do you, how do you put yourself in that mindset? Because in this book, within the first chapter or so, I mean, the first chapter, the first couple of pages, it's straight into sort of like something that you'd have to get into a certain mindset to, to, to sort of think about. And some of it's, you know, it's not horror, but it's, you know, it's, it's gritty and stuff. How, yeah. how do you put yourself in that mindset for the books you write? Well, I think um, bad people are interesting. You know, their motivations, why they do the things that they do. I think that's interesting. And I think they're far more interesting than good people. You know what I mean? Uh, so I've always been drawn to stories like that and I guess reading about people like that. Um, but I research the dark side of things a lot. Um, and you'd be amazed at the stuff that, the places I've ended up researching this and the people I've ended up talking with researching this, <laughs> it's just, yeah. <laughs> places and pe people I've been with that perhaps shouldn't have Rob been. Parker does his research on the dark web. Uh, yeah, first. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I like, um, I, I like um, working in pubs, you know, and cafes, but usually, you know, pubs, it's an atmosphere that I've always felt like I'm settled in. Um, and when you sit in a pub, um, people find out what you do and they come over and they go like, what are you doing? You know, and some are rude. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> it's good for you. <laughs> some are, um, interested and some are like, oh yeah, I've got a story for you now. So my sort of like BS meter is pretty all right at the moment. I'm dead gullible, but I think in a pub setting, I'm like, yeah, I know. Like one fella told me he'd, um, hoverboarded the Great Wall of China. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I wonder what that chapter was in this book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's one of those flights of bands we're talking about. So I'm like, you know, but um, sometimes you're like, hey, you want to meet this guy, you know, like, and then you get introduced to somebody and like, um, there are so many occasions like that. Um, and I like going to places, like I like traveling. I love going new places. If I'm away with work, uh, we've got a book event somewhere, I'll ask someone there, you know, like if they're working at the, a book event or, or there's an author there like what's a pub around here I should just not go to under any circumstances and they'll go like oh the 
flapper and seal down on wherever and then i'll go like okay no worries and as soon as the event's done i'll get an uber there immediately <laughs> <laughs> just go in and set on my laptop and sit there writing and then you just be amazed where it leads you you know and and people are you know again people are amazing people are fast we're a fascinating species aren't we like we're weird but we can be extremely kind we can also be extremely cruel um one when i went to the pub one guy said um you know like what are you doing? That means you can sit here in an afternoon having a beer on your laptop. And I was like, well, you know, hi, <laughs> hello to you too. And he said, um, you know, what what do you do then? You know, well, um, you know, I'm I write. You know, like, ooh, are you published? You know, like that. Oh, quite common. Like, oh no, it's cool. You know, like I was like, I am. Yeah. And he said, oh, like, is it anything I'd have read? Like. I don't know. Can you read? <laughs> <laughs> but like, I didn't obviously. I, I, like, I don't know, you know. Like, but I said, "Well, what's your name then?" So I said, oh, "It's this," you know. And then um, turns out he had seven of mine on his Kindle. <laughs> right. oh, like, yeah, that was like a mega jackpot moment. Um, but there's loads, loads, and loads of different things like that. Like I've ended up like um, I was writing a, a true crime thing for a podcast company about um, the craze. Um, with some rum boys, weren't they? Um, <laughs> had a lot of fun writing about them, but uh, I did some interviews with uh, people who had researched them and stuff like that, but we couldn't get anyone who'd met them, you know? Um, and I remembered this pub that one of the guys who was goes in there was a um, involved in the nightclub scene in the 60s. And so I went and I said, I saw him like, Come on, did, you, did you ever meet the craze? You know, and he went like, sit down, young man. <laughs> who we had like he'd met them like <laughs> on a number of occasions in the, one of the clubs that he provided acts for at the time and it's that like you just like going out and living a life and saying yes to stuff I'll, I'll say yes to pretty much anything within reason uh, but like, as long as it's that's like... why he agreed to this podcast though. <laughs> 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 we know his secret <laughs> but like even if it's something you don't want to do you will oh, just, cheers bro <laughs> <laughs> I was really excited to have you on today <laughs> <laughs> this event <laughs> notwithstanding uh, but you know what I mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> you end up like I even if I don't want to do it I'll go like yeah okay because I'll only learn for, you know, more about myself or have something more to write about you know if you say yes I've ended up in all sorts of scrapes and places and you know um, but I, I promise you like there's been a load of stuff that I've written in these books that people have said the editors have come to me and said that's too fantastical you got to take it out and I'm like well did I? You know, it's real. You know, it's a real thing that you know that happened in that book. Happens in the sequel. Very much happened in the third one. Um, same with all the Ben Brackens. But like, because because life is madder than fiction. It really is. Absolutely is. Um, so the, yeah, there's a few ideas that I'm sitting on, which I'm like, I don't know whether I can write about. It's too mad. Mm. Two bananas. What goes on in the? You know, the ending of this book had to be changed because um, they said. Uh, Got to be careful because you're not there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they, but they said like what had happened was like there's no way that would happen. I said, well, it did happen a lot. Uh, I'll finish so, it and then, and then yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what the yeah. original ending was on the alternative ending. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was yeah, it was one of those like, um, and they said that the original ending would have needed a trigger warning actually, right. which would have killed the book dead. They said so. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm glad we did. I'm glad we changed it. No. Yeah. And bef <laughs> before you said obviously write about things you enjoy if you're starting out and stuff is that true for these this trilogy obviously you know not not the not the not the uh nitty-gritty bits but the <laughs> the sort of you know the the true crime the the police yeah. detective stuff because something that i've loved myself obviously from a tv world is i've loved the sort of you know the harlem Coburn. i think we spoke about this the yeah. sort of true crime they're they're very much in that space so when you told me what this book was about it sort of fit with what i've been watching so I was happy to jump into a, a book like that. Is oh, is that man, the kind of so stuff glad. you like enjoy writing? Yeah, um, I, I, um, the unpredictable is what I liked, and I like to. I don't like neat bows on stuff, you know, like because life doesn't happen, does it? You know, so I like to push the envelope a little bit. But again, things with high stakes, and when you don't know what's going to come next, those are always the stories I've been hooked on. And again, I think like yeah, seriously, when you're writing what you want to write about, the best stuff comes out, you know. Um, whether it's a theme or whether it's, it's never like, it, you know, like wordplay. I never get excited about like wordplay, you know, like, yeah. hey, that was a great, you know, <laughs> adverb you used there, Rob. You know, it's never like that. It's more just, it's all story. We get that a lot in schools, you know, like, um, so I'll say like, what's in a story, kids? And they'll go like, 
uh, um, you know, um, oh, I don't know, compound adjectives. I don't even know if that's a thing. Um, and they were like, do you think I sit there and go like, hey, we need a compound adjective yeah, at this yeah. point? Like, no, nothing like that at all. So, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for my amazing editors, but that kind of stuff and spelling, I'm not great. <laughs> I'm literally like that at all. Need all the help I can get. <laughs> but it's your story, yeah. Write what you love. Yeah. I mean, I mean that that's probably true for, for any industry within the creative sector. Like, again, our early podcast, as I say, we our first, our first guest, so our early podcasts have been about turning sort of your hobbies a bit of a not a very nice word because it de- passion. demeans it doesn't it but like passion into yeah. into into a career and, and when i started out music videos was my thing yours was always big drums and big bands for, for recording audio so you you just lean into what you know and yeah. what you enjoy I, that's it that's it i don't think there's any such thing you know like a what guilty pleasure i don't believe in that expression at all because mm. if you love something just dig the hell out of it just dig the hell out of it and enjoy yourself. You know, but life's too short. If you, you know, like I, what do I like? Do you know what I like doing at night? Like seriously. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do we need a uh, Do we need a trigger warning on this podcast? Honestly, like I love. I, <laughs> I absolutely love um, when everyone's in bed. Like, <laughs> like I love making a cup of soup. Like loads of seasoning. I really love my pepper. And then I like playing um, video games on silent, but listening to podcasts about sasquatch or <laughs> like no, like you can you conspiracy not no no not conspiracy at all i just think it sits in a it... tinfoil hat <laughs> i <laughs> i look because they're like mad stories yeah and there's something so comforting about listening to these people go like you know say like i'm you know uh, i was walking through the woods and uh, my god he was nine feet tall he shut down at me like and i'm like this is so it <laughs> like, i would love to get the end of this book and it'd be like and the killer was Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing awkwardly now. That was that was the alternate. That was the alternate. Yeah, that was the, that was the one they said you're gonna take out. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, no, it was real. Someone in the pub. It was real. Someone in the pub. <laughs> it was real. Yeah. And no one ever listens to a podcast. <laughs> no one in the pub ever comes out and goes like, you know what? There's, I've been a Bigfoot guy. I'm a Bigfoot guy. You know. No, no, it, I'm not. Just big fun, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I picked that one out because it always gets the biggest laugh. <laughs> so, like, it's like anything like that, like um, frogmen. Like, I, I, I listen to this amazing people one about live under the Alabama and frogmen. Like, how funny is that, really? I love this. Something so comforting to the, to listen to this stuff. It's just there's more stories, isn't it? You know, right, the cup of soup is crucial, though. <laughs> totally Extra crucial. pepper. Extra pepper. <laughs> <laughs> See, do you remember what we were saying before? I'm happy to lean into my weirdness. It's better than Weirdness is good. It's better than boring. It makes you happy though, doesn't it? You know, weird is interesting. Seriously, if you drive past my house and you look through the window and you see it's like eleven o'clock at night, like look at that guy <laughs> with Man, a big smile on his hour. face, <laughs> with a massive grinder <laughs> <laughs> in the tiny mug. <laughs> a little bit, absolutely a little bit. I've got I'm such a clear image, Rob. Honestly, yeah, such in my storyteller, as well, yeah, in my Jimmy Jam. <laughs> <laughs> As an author now, you've obviously been in the industry for for a decent amount of time. You've got a good number of book, books published. Is there anything that people starting out sort of wouldn't know maybe about you or about the sort of journey or the industry that would be like good good to know about, whether yeah. it be like connections or where to start, what to pick? I know we've touched on sort of, you know, your first steps to become an author. Was anything towards the industry as a whole that you think is something that people wouldn't really know? Yeah, I think there's, um, I do love um, dispelling industry myths as well. So one of the questions I get asked a lot at schools is, where's your Lamborghini parked? And... <laughs> <laughs> but to put that into context, so the new book that came out, um, was it two weeks ago? Um, I was chatting with my publisher at the time, you know, um, sorry, at, at that event, you know, um, and he uh, he was telling me that he makes 17p on every hardback, on every paperback. It's not a great deal of money, you know. So, to be the average um, wage for an author in this country was three years ago, it was 12 grand. Now it's seven and a half. So, you have to be extraordinarily lucky to make big money from this. So, that would be one of the things is temper your expectations. Don't go in thinking, you know, don't let this dilute your enjoyment, but don't go in thinking this is going to make you a millionaire overnight kind of thing. It might happen. It might happen. And that's, that's great. But those stories are really few and far between. There are so many amazing, amazing authors out there who are 
with long, long careers. And this is hard to make this work. This really is hard to make. I'm not talking about myself here, but it is hard to make it work, you know. Um, and you have your good moments and your bad moments. And I think, you know, most authors are only sort of one flop away from, you know. And most, you know, lots and lots of authors do this on the side of doing something else. You know, the fact that I'm doing it full time is means I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm, in, I'm just embarrassed how lucky I am. You know, I'm so lucky to get to do this full time. Um, the other one I think would be uh, just embrace rejection. Don't you know? If uh, some people get in touch with me and and they say, you know, I um, I've written something and I sent it to a couple of agents and they said no and I've just put it away for a bit. Like you can't do that if you really want to do this. Just you know, for every you know, you all it took in that two hundred and fifty knows was eventually I ended up with a yes. I didn't, I stopped counting at that point after that um, and got back on the horse and just kept sending it out and I eventually got a yes. And that was the only one that I remember, you know, until I got talking about it um, in situations like this. The other thing would be, you know, even though you make it and you get that yes, it doesn't mean it's plain sailing from there. So since then I've had another 150 career rejections on all sorts of different projects or um, you know, whether it be changing agent or something like that, you know. Um, but the important thing is just, you know, if you're writing what you enjoy, you've got the edge on other stuff. If you go into it cynically and go like, right, I've noticed that, you know, do you remember there was a while where it was like the girl on the train and the girl in the window? And you know, if you go in that to write the next The Girl on book, the zeitgeist will have moved on, you know, before you know it. Just write what you, create your own zeitgeist. Write what you think is the the best and funnest thing that you can do that you're really really loving um your words will sparkle someone else will see that they'll pick you up and then before you know it who knows it might work but just enjoy it That's yeah it. i'm relating to that from a <clears throat> excuse me from like a songwriting perspective again like it's very easy to it's very easy for me to write like depressing sad songs because they're like easy to write but <laughs> i i've ever tried writing happy songs and um, sometimes it just surprises. Sometimes it surprises well, you. Like, but we're talking better days, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolute banger. Yeah, I mean, it's still got That's a, sort a sad of like, song hidden in. It's still got a sad undertones. It's like how I feel sounds like a happy song, which it's really not. Like that's the that's the thing about like our band. But like, yeah, going back to that point, like being able to do different different stuff, I suppose. Yeah, yeah and you you don't need to pigeonhole yourself as well. I think that and that relates back to the question as well. Is that you don't need to be yeah, like, because we, we all get, every author gets pigeonholed. Like, oh, you're the guy with the, you know, like I'm aware that my next two books or two books I've written have got underwater themes. And I'm like aware that if they were to go bigger than this, oh, he's the underwater guy. <laughs> you know, yeah, that kind yeah. of thing. Like, so when's your next underwater book? You know, that yeah. kind of thing. And it might just have been, hey, I've got some, you know, I've gone through a phase of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, who knows? Cup of soup might be another phase. <laughs> you know? I know a lot of people said that there was a lot of Guinness being drunk in the, this trilogy. Uh, yes. So there's another phase. I've noticed yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Life can't change your spot. <laughs> I just want to love vocation, life and death. Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely plug, by the way. <laughs> hey, vocation, if you're listening, I uh, yeah, love yeah, a sponsorship. Yeah. <laughs> It's going to be the next artwork. I know. I know, yeah. I'm just going to spin it around to face the camera, but then I'll dribble it all down myself. <laughs> One of those sexy, like... Uh... Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I'm doing plug. podcasts, I always drink vocabulary. And <laughs> yeah. um, that, that whole rejection sort of perseverance thing is really interesting and and stuff. And, and, and it's the same in any industry. I feel like a lot of things you've said sort of amplify what we've spoke about in our previous podcast are just about the sort of sticking to it and stuff and we spoke about before about the the, the beer commercial we did last week mm. we've got like a really nice relationship now with um northern monk of every now and again they come to us for, for jobs and stuff that relationship became because i had this really good idea of doing a product commercial for a beer but you can't reach out to beer companies asking for money if you've yeah. got nothing to show them yeah so i got an instagram and a message tons of beer companies and none of them replied to me and I said, it's free. I just want to make one. I just want four, four beers. Yeah. And I'll prove to you what we can do and stuff. And the, the company that got back to us was Northern Monk. Sent us a beer, made them the video and stuff. And now we've worked with them for, for, for two years now. And, and that sort of like perseverance, if, if we'd have given up, would have been a shame to have, I wouldn't have a beer commercial in our portfolio now, which is sort of that sort of 
perseverance. I think it translates across any industry, especially creative industry that you that you do you will get ignored or rejected or or for whatever reason. Yeah. I think that you know you've, you've sort of. But I think that's so cool that that you know, and and it's very much like a similar kind of thing, isn't it? But sticking your head up and saying, "Look, I can do this. I just want the chance to show you." Yeah, you know, and and that's what we have to do, you know, and I hope that this is why doing this has been so great because we're both from, we're all, you know, from the similar neck of woods, aren't we? And we're all sticking our hands up and saying, look, we can do great stuff from where we are. We don't have to go traveling. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to go to the big cities to do it. We're doing it right here where we're from. Um, that's we a question that we've had to, there's a question that we've had to sort of <laughs> argue, not, not as in argue, overcome. as in overcome, over, overcome or, de, or debate as in mm. we live in Warrington, Manchester's there, Liverpool's there. Do we need to set up shop in Liverpool? Do we need to set up shop in Manchester because, you know, the big city. They're the big of. cities, and yeah. And the answer for us was always no because there's for, obviously from for our side there's a great music industry in Warrington. Yeah, there's a great music scene, and people will travel yeah. in, and people will care about the about the city. And I think if if everyone from a small town jumped ship and moved to the closest city, that town's never going to grow. Totally agree. So for us, for for Warrington, I feel like I'd like to think we've established ourselves as like a, a Warrington business that sort of cares about the, the town. And I think for us to move to Liverpool or Manchester, I just wouldn't it wouldn't feel right. Totally yeah, agree. just be weird. We'd it'd lose all of the sort of authenticity. Authenticity, yeah. Because like, yeah, we yeah. we like when we've been looking and things to like when we were first moving into this unit and things like like Ollie said, like do we need to actually look for a city? Yeah, and get closer. But like like the. Like like we say, we're we're right in the middle of two big cities. The the the, the um the music scene here is amazing. We're right on like it's one road to Birm. Like we had a, we worked from a band from Birmingham that came yeah. up to shoot a music video, and we looked just out of interest like how far it is from here to Birmingham, and it's like two roads or something. Yeah, yeah M six M sixty two. That's what another thing that can be said for Warrington is we're not we're not struggling on transport links. So definitely you know, not. It's amazing. Yeah. No, I, I honestly I think and and. If if the the town is going in good place and the, and the, like there's been a lot of regeneration in the middle of the town as well, hasn't there? Mm. Um, and yeah, just keep putting Warrington on the map. Definitely, yeah, hundred percent, mate. Well, I think that sounds like a nice place to round things off. Um, thank you so much, mate. Honestly, oh, yeah, we've we so thoroughly good. enjoyed thank it. Thank you for everything. Keep, uh, please, guys, keep doing what you're doing. Love the music. Love you the production hey, work. Keep these coming as oh, well. I will, I will. You tell me hooks now. Don't tell me who to kill and who not to kill. I'll lose <laughs> it again. <laughs> I'm coming for you that, that uh, alternate ending though. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to read it like, <laughs> of the book, but what could have happened? <laughs> but honestly, thank you so much. You've been our, our first guest and you've, I think you've really like sort of, what's the word? Like, encapsulated what, what this podcast is, is, is about and stuff. So thank you so much. And as always, thank you so much for listening, everyone. Um, please listen back to our previous episodes and look forward to our episodes coming in the future. Many thank thanks. You. Thank and you thank you to Rob. Others. Here we go. Go 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 read your new book. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>